Hello, everyone. We're going to wait just a minute until everyone shows up. Welcome. Okay, I, uh, well, the numbers are still growing, but um, maybe I'll get started just so we can uh, get to the panelists and have them get as much time as possible. Um, my name is Lauren Glass. I'm the chair of the Department of English, and it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce this panel. Um, I'm going to be brief because the time and space really should be for the panelists, and I feel like this is a time for people like me to be listening over speaking. Um, I do want to let everyone know that this is part of a theme year that the college has organized on pursuing racial justice at the University of Iowa, and this particular month focuses on art and the pursuit of social justice. There's a lot of wonderful programming, including this evening, the Black Lives on Screen series will be kicking off through the Cinema Studies program. All that information is available on the CLAS website. I want to thank Professor Alan McVeigh for organizing the programming for this month. I want to thank Lauren Haldeman for doing all the wonderful web promotion, and then also Nick Arp and his team for handling all the behind the scenes technology so that we all uh, appear fluidly and smoothly without interruption uh, for this discussion. So, you know, I just want to open this panel by thanking the students uh, in the English department and the nonfiction writing program who stood up this summer and demanded change. Uh, I had just become chair when they wrote to the faculty decrying and describing the lack of support for students of color in the department and providing a list of urgent action, action items for the faculty to address. These students were writing in anger and impatience, but they were also writing in love and hope. They didn't want to destroy the department, they wanted to change it, and this panel is part of that change. It is one component of a larger plan, one step on a collective journey, and I'm deeply grateful to the students whose passion and protest got this all started. I'm also deeply grateful to Professor Gigi Durham, uh, who was generous enough to take on the directorship of the NWP this year. She's been an invaluable colleague and collaborator in our efforts to create a more diverse, equitable, inclusive, and accessible department. Working with her has given me hope and confidence that with sustained collective effort, we can and will build a department that welcomes and nurtures and challenges and supports all writers and readers fairly and equally and with respect. So finally, I want to thank Felicia Rose Chavez for returning with grace and courage to Iowa to help us in this effort. The Anti-Racist Writing Handbook is a revelation, a vision of the kind of program and department we aspire to become. I can't wait to hear from all these panelists and to build on their wisdom and insight and vision. So on to them. Thank you so much, Lauren, for that great introduction. Um, I am going to introduce the panelists in a moment. I am Meenakshi Gigi Durham, as Lauren noted, and I'm director of the NWP now. Um, I do wanna mention to the audience that you can ask questions in the Q&A box that um, should be accessible at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can post questions anytime, but we'll get to them after we finish the panel discussion. Um, but we certainly would like to have engagement with the audience, so. Um, so please do add your questions and comments as they occur to you during our discussion. Okay, let me turn quickly now to our panelists. Um, I'm going to begin with our special guest, Felicia Rose Chavez, an award-winning educator with an MFA in creative nonfiction from the University of Iowa. She's author of the Anti-Racist Writing Workshop, How to Decolonize the Creative Classroom, and co-editor of the Breakbeat Poets Volume 4, Latinx, with Willy Perdomo and Jose Olivares. Um, originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, she currently serves as creativity and innovation scholar in residence at Colorado College. For more information about the anti-racist writing workshop and to access a multi-genre compilation of contemporary writers of color, please visit www.antiracistworkshop.com. I'll turn now to Deborah Elizabeth Whaley. PhD, who is an artist, cura curator, writer, poet, vegan blogger, and professor at the University of Iowa. Her research and teaching fields include American literature, history, and culture, 
women and gender studies, comparative ethnic studies, black cultural studies, the digital humanities, the medical humanities, popular culture and the visual arts. She's published three books, including most recently, Black Women in Sequence, Re-Inking Comics, Graphic Novels and Anime. Matthew B. Kelly is a writer from Atlanta, Georgia. He's a graduate of Morehouse College and the Iowa Writers Workshop where he was a Truman Capote Fellow in Fiction. He's currently the Provost Visiting Writer in Fiction at the University of Iowa. Mickey Hill is a poet and educator whose work explores themes of identity, place, disaster, and ecology. Originally from Louisiana, they hold an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop in Poetry. Mickey is the current Provost Writing Writer in Poetry at the University of Iowa visiting writer in poetry at the University of Iowa, sorry. Um, okay, so Zoom time is different from real world time and we only have an hour. Uh, but I wanna begin by thanking Felicia for catalyzing this conversation about the need for anti-racist transformation in creative writing programs, as well as in other disciplines. As Lauren mentioned, recently graduate students and alums of the nonfiction writing program penned an open letter calling out racial biases of the past in the curriculum pedagogy and faculty and student body in our program and outlining action items for progressive change, which we're committed to taking up. I want to launch the discussion today with a question. And I know many of the people who uh, signed the letter are in the audience today, and I just want to thank you for this. So um, anyway, I'm going to start sort of at the end. Um, in almost the last line of your book, Felicia, you write, they say that a writer's work must stand alone, that I won't be there when you pick up my book, but maybe I can be if you let me. Maybe we can build this thing together. Well, you are here, Felicia, and I'd like to ask you to begin by reflecting on how we can build this thing together, the anti-racist writing workshop. What are the practices we need to face up to challenge and change? And I'm gonna ask everyone about this, but I'll start with you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to be here and for taking the time um, to sit with my words. I appreciate it. Um, I hope that uh, I can learn from everyone on the panel today as well. Um, you know, it starts in here, right? It starts with each and every one of us. I know that we immediately target administrative bureaucracy. Um, I truly believe that it necessitates each and every one of us to commit to the work um, in terms of decolonizing our teaching habits. We don't think of them in that context, but they are something that we've observed in terms of a set of, a set of skills. And then we replicate, maybe sometimes without necessarily training in how to do that, um, specifically in anti-racist pedagogy. So the first step is reflecting on and admitting to um, and assessing our own individual implicit bias and how that reinforces individual and institutional racism. Each and every one of us takes part in that legacy. Um, and then we pivot and we aim to discover new possibilities. Um, and that is a personal commitment that each and every one of us has to take on. Um, first, that necessitates decentering our own authority, um, our own ego and control and domination um, that we think uh, equates with professionalism in the classroom. Um, instead, we're able to see and hear each and every one of our students, um, which means no more silence, right? Um, so it necessitates reorienting our focus from speaking to listening, um, from product to process, um, and from authority to allyship. Um, and second, we decenter whiteness as neutral and objective and universal um, as it is embedded in our marketing materials, our syllabi, our lecture notes, our curriculum, our frame of reference, um, and our faculty and administration. Um, and thirdly, we must reconceptualize craft concept, concepts as a whole, um, recognizing them as malleable and not some immovable pillar of you know, white Western hegemony and instead um, allow for um, collective meaning making when it comes to setting the terms, the stakes, the vision um, for our own work and allowing our students to trust their own intuition and honor their own writing legacies. So um, 
again, it's it's decentering ourselves from the from the middle of the thing, um, and and decentering whiteness um, as the as the assumed base, and then um, reconceptualizing craft itself as we go on to study writing. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Mickey. What what do you think? What practices do we need to confront and challenge, and how? I think for me in the classes that I've taught. One thing that I like to do is kind of uh, lift up the veil um, of what it means to be the professor um, or the person leading the workshop. Um, so I try to use terms such as facilitator. So I'm facilitating this learning environment. Um, and I also try to make sure that my students understand that I don't know everything. I'm not coming here um, with some sort of uh, extreme knowledge base um, and I'm, I'm not all knowing um, and that I'm capable of making mistakes and that I'm human. Um, and I always try to instill in them and understanding that I want to learn from them and engage with them as well, um, that it's a process for us both. Um, and I think more than just uh, having like a diverse syllabus, um, which I try to have uh, every semester, um, interrogating what it really means to be bringing in um, certain, certain writers and certain content um, and making space for the historical context of that. Um, so like, for example, um, I often uh, talk about writers from the Black Arts Movement. Um, and in that case, I bring in information in that historical context, uh, because I think it's really important not to divorce uh, someone's art from the context in which it was created. Um, and when we start to um, unravel uh, the, his the history, um, the literary history, and also social history. Um, I think that that allows us to get into some of the more complex conversations um, about the writing itself um, and about how we react and we respond to it. Well, that's great. Okay. That, yeah, it actually makes me think of more questions, but I'll, I want to hear from the other panelists and then maybe ask a spinoff question. So I guess I'll turn to Deborah. Uh, this book just opened up a watershed for me in so many different ways. You know, it took me back to my um, graduate studies years, uh, you know, doing a graduate program in the Midwest. Uh, it took me back to being a facilitator of workshops, but also being that author and just thinking about what that process was like, um, how it was beneficial, how it could be better. And so just, just so many touchstones, so many amazing things. Um, a couple things, I guess I'll put a finer uh, point on uh, here. Um, one of the things I was thinking a lot about is this sort of um, issue of recruitment and retention. And the thing um, that both the book brings up and uh, Gigi that you touched on as well, even when we do have diverse authors sort of come in, do we see that in the student body? And then when we do sometimes see it in the curriculum or the syllabus, how do certain writers come in and then how are they articulated in that um, workshop, working together journey that um, transpires in the, the classroom, in the hallways, and in all these spaces that we're collaborating. And I think a, a few things for me. Uh, one is that, you know, I think a lot of historically marginalized groups, um, people of color, non-binary people, are not always encouraged uh, to do writing. Uh, I think, uh, it's not often that we hear that we're a good writers, um, that that could be something to really aspire to. And that starts really, really early. And so, you know, when the, the book is talking about things like craft and form and content, these are things that start at a really, really early stage that ends up either um, impeding folks into maybe seeing themselves in this space or when they do inhabit that space, really struggling for um, a, a number of reasons. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for an English professor in college who told me, I think you're a good writer. And I got to like 22 and no one had ever told me I was a good writer. You know, I would not have even necessarily thought that that was um, possible. So then thinking about how can we do these sort of early modes of collaboration and intervention um, to, to address that. The other thing I want to put um, uh, to just amplify is uh, how we work together um, in the space. What are the roles of engagement? And one of the things that is so important to me in my pedagogy is to remind people that writing is difficult. 
this is hard. This is personal. And saying that over and over again, I mean, it may seem obvious, but just taking the time to say that. And I think another thing, and I'm always learning as well, and I'm learning from my students, so you know, I'm not professing as this sort of like master um, workshopper, but um, the other thing that I think has been really important is to always um, reiterate throughout the semester, the course, the workshop, whatever, that good writing is only about multiple drafts. And the reason why I say that is because I like to underscore that we are all amazing writers. Um, we are all colleagues who are on this journey, um, you know, together. And uh, I just, uh, so many other things I think that I could say and talk about, but I want to, you know, move it, move it around um, the room, but I'm just, I'm really happy to um, bring up uh, several other things. Um, the comments so far are actually um, sparking new questions for me, but I'd like to turn to Matthew to talk about this one, and then I'm going to ask some things that came up. Goodness, Gigi, why would you, why would you have me be after such brilliance? What am I supposed to say now? I don't even, goodness gracious. Well, um, <laughs> to be honest, all, all, all of my comments are, 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 are slight variations of, of what everyone's saying. And so um, I'm thinking about Mickey's comment um, uh, and, and practice of, right, um, when looking, uh, for example, looking at uh, writers from the Black Arts Movement, right, contextualizing that work in relation to uh, the times in their lives. And then, all, and so to, to, and to add to that is to contextualize those lives in, in, in service to the craft of what's happening within them, right? Which is, uh, which I think about this when I, um, uh, I'm gonna bring, probably bring her up a lot today. Um, uh, Morrison, today's her birthday, funny Morrison. Um, and uh, when, when she talks about, right, um, racism, uh, uh, the, one of the chief tenets of racism is to create, uh, is to create other in the marginalized groups, right? Uh, which is obviously uh, the, the truth about uh, all the other, uh, all the other forms of oppression in this particular way. Um, but right, to, to treat multicultural art as sociology, right? Uh, uh, you know, Dostoevsky gets taught in um, English or, and Shakespeare gets taught in English classes. Um, uh, Morrison, Hurston uh, get taught in Black studies, um, which is, uh, it's not wrong to place it there. Uh, what's, uh, what's, what's racist is to place it only there. Um, and so to, 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 to center multicultural art in terms of that craft. Um, and so one of the things that I do is that uh, in my fiction classes, um, I teach from, there's a book called here's, um, Free Within Ourselves, um, Fiction Lessons for Black Authors. Um, I have had a grand total of uh, zero black students in my, <laughs> in my, uh, my fiction courses. Um, and I don't plan on stopping to use the book um, because first and foremost, it's an incredible craft book. Um, one that really, really engages in, I think, um, a rigorous, uh, discussion of craft that I think is helpful to, to, to any and all students. But secondly, um, again, I go back to Morrison, right? And she talks about uh, how, you know, um, Dostoevsky writes for a, uh, a Russian audience and we still read him. And she says, if I'm specific enough and don't over explain, anyone can overhear, right? And so, I think about this to, to, to center for in my class, I center uh, blackness within these particular craft points. Now we, uh, we move outside of the text into uh, other, other cultures, right? But when we look at craft by centering that blackness, it allows them to contextualize themselves. Uh, my white students in particular, or all students, but my white students is who I'm, uh, which, which, which it's, it's most daunting and most challenging for them in relation to blackness. And then, and so for example, one of the things that the, the book talks about in, um, in terms of characters, right? Creating characters. Uh, Rhodes talks about, uh, Jewel Parker Rhodes is the one who wrote the book. She talks about the difference between stock characters and stereotypes. And for the students, they're like, this is the first time I've ever heard this because we've heard of stereotypes, right? But then they then to interrogate this, uh, this difference, this dichotomy and realize that stock characters are born out of uh, the culture that it is representing and stereotypes are imposed upon a culture, they're then able to say, 
why are these things happening, right? And so it affords them nuance. It affords them, them it affords them to understand themselves in relation to these particular topics, um, which I think is just, uh, I think it's just a really, really wonderful thing. And to be honest with you, um, not my intention at, at the beginning, uh, the truth is I had to pick a textbook and I said, this is the only one I know because uh, I love me some black stuff. <laughs> and it was just like, they were, they were like, oh yeah. So like, you know, here's, here's a stock character that comes from my culture and also again right to say you have a culture um my, my my lovely white students um before whiteness um there was something there um dig deep right but then also dig into your whiteness right dig into all of it look at yourself right as morrison says and, and once you stripped everything down to your little and i'm not gonna, i'm not gonna keep going i think <laughs> but I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move along move along it looks like Felicia had something to add to that. It's real quick. I mean, I, I say this in the book, but I think it's an essential practice for us to contextualize all of the work that we bring into the classroom. So beyond our writers of color. And I think that's, you know, that's practice, that's a common practice for educators to reach out with supplements, right? When they're teaching Baldwin, as, as so many tend to do, um, they'll contextualize it within a, a period of history. And we kind of like grapple with this, this new voice in the classroom. Um, but I think each and every one of our authors deserves that treatment as, as Matthew was leaning toward. I think that um, when we incorporate identity politics into craft itself, then it's something that we treat each and every text that our students um, experience with a conversation about identity politics and, and race. I think it's an essential practice. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, as Mickey was speaking too, and Matthew, I mean, all of you, but, but um, the idea of contextualizing and um, you know, the way you present the material, that's getting into um, pedagogical techniques. So, you know, Mickey said, it's not just the content, right? So you can't treat these works as equivalent. You can't just look at them all as sort of great literature or something and, and not think about the perspective of the author, the experiences of the author, the historical context in which they were written, how they connect to the present moment. Um, so, so that that type of pedagogy, um, you know, I'd, I'd just like to hear more about what you think about how you present, especially, and how how teachers of writing need to think, especially about um, how they're working with uh, text from writers of color in the classroom. And I'll let anyone who wants to go first. Sure, I can, uh, maybe speak to the role of interdisciplinarity in that, uh, and so when you're working, I mean, whoever is showing up in the curriculum, how you contextualize it with other materials, even if the focus is on writing to just give it a sort of a broader context, whether that's historical um, media in terms of film, poetry, whatever it is, just having that sort of really kind of interdisciplinary context to think about the ways in which we um, write the truth, you know, write characters if we're into fiction, how we, um, imagine the elsewhere uh, uh, in poetry or other uh, forms of creative practice. And so uh, another thing that uh, this book really helps me think more about, you know, so before I was sort of talking about, um, you know, just making it a very uh, known that this process is hard, it's going to be tricky, and the really, um, you know, important thing about revision, but exposing my own process which doesn't, um, you know, so I was talking before about the writing life with which, you know, the book touches on as well. And that doesn't start with a pen for me. Uh, it doesn't necessarily start with um, research for me. Sometimes it starts with doing a poem. It may start with doing a painting. It may start with a lot of things. And I just say that to also underscore this point about everything that we're bringing into the space that shows up or not in our writing that helps facilitate our voice and I think, um, you know, the, I guess the last thing that I'll say is I think um, those who want to embrace sort of radical anti-colonial pedagogy, um, you know, we are really encouraging uh, writers, our colleagues to take risks to find their voice, but then sometimes we don't follow up on that. And that's something that I also try to work on myself and underscore, you know, um, because 
I mean, all of this is working on all of us in a lot of different ways, even when we're trying to move out of those paradigms. But we say this a lot uh, in the digital humanities. Um, so you just don't tell uh, you know, your colleagues to go off and take risks. You have their back, <laughs> which can mean a lot of different things. Yes, it means deep engagement with the work, but it also means supporting that person in every aspect of their writing career and life. Some folks are good at being mentors. Some folks are good at being sponsored. You know, it's, th there's all these different roles that I think we can play um, in the writing life, um, in the life of young writers. That's really important and just sort of tapping into those strengths and um, helping to amplify uh, the, the strengths and those that we um, are working with and, and just thinking about those networks of support. Something I would add to the conversation about um, context is that it's also incredibly difficult. Um, and I'll avoid saying that it's burdensome, but what I'll say is that there are some days when I have a plan of talking about something specific and it's just, I don't have the spoons that day, right? Because it's a very vulnerable process for me as a black femme to come and try to add context, uh, context to Morgan Parker by teaching my students about the Jezebel. Um, there's a lot of emotional labor that comes with that. And I'm not always able to meet that emotional demand. Um, but I think that if I'm bringing it into the classroom, I do feel that I have a responsibility um, to take it where it needs to be taken, um, to protect myself, to protect my people, to protect the authors that we're reading, um, that I do have to be in a space to be able to really interrogate that. Um, but it's an incredibly difficult practice and it's not being an educator of color, you're not existing in a vacuum. Um, and so there is an effect on, on me personally. Um, and that's another aspect of, of the idea of an anti-racist curriculum. Yeah, um, and I know Felicia was gonna say something here, um, but I also had a quick thought and I, I don't mean to, I mean, what, yes, let me turn it over to you, Felicia. And then I have a thought that was sort of based on I just wanted to say that, like, honor that, like, that's very real. And it's something that, um, you know, I, I try to um, lessen that burden, lighten that load by um, my own strategy in terms of, of treating texts um, is to teach living writers. Um, I like to engage young writers when possible. Um, because we can invite them into our rooms and we can invite them into the conversation and we're no longer responsible for contextualizing them or speaking on their behalf. They're able to engage with us in dialogue about their process, about their intention, about um, their, their vision for the work. And I think that it's a really beautiful opportunity that we have that we so often issue for sake of, you know, this, these canonical authors who um, signify real learning or, or literacy. Um, I think that so many um, living authors have so much to, to offer us um, if we only engage in, in conversation with them. And so my own practice is to bring them into the classroom via Zoom or even a phone call on speaker, um, whatever they're most comfortable with in person um, when possible. Um, and when they're not able to engage in that way, I'll um, print out um, interviews with them or a blog post that they've done or social media posts and, and a picture to, to embody the person and allow them to have a sense of voice um, within the class. And in the same way, Deborah, um, I try to pick work that's risky and experimental, maybe not a success sometimes, like in terms of my own personal aesthetic preferences, but it's doing something really interesting. And I think when we encourage our own students to do that kind of work, it's helpful to include those voices as well um, so that they have a model for people who are taking risks and doing doing something different. And there's a payoff there. There's a relationship and they can identify as author. Um, even if this particular project just goes right back in the drawer, right? There's, there's something to aspire to. And, and Matthew, you were going to add? Yes. Um... 
to I'm gonna extrapolate a little bit from uh, Felicia's point of uh, of the, the successful, if whether or not we think the piece is successful, and, I, and I'm gonna place the burden back or I suppose the onus back on myself, right? And think what happens when I am not successful in teaching a particular thing, right? Um, and 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 I love and I, what I loved about this book, right, is that it's uh, is is the democratizing of. Uh, of the of the workshop space, right? Which is which, as as Felicia opened with, you know, decentering um, the the workshop leader as this uh, all knowing being who is the dis dispenser of craft in this particular way, and acknowledging that um, that I am a person with bias, um, which is when I think of the question, which is to you know to face up to in this particular way. I think the for me, what it, what, what's what's best, um, what I what I what, when people ask, because I don't try, to, I try not to give unsolicited uh, advice. When asked, right, um, is to is to assume um, bias, right? Um, if if when I benefit from a particular um, uh, uh, culture, right, or or when one of my identities um, is oppressive, I'm like I'm blind to things. I'm blind to things, or rather, I my I, I don't necessarily always see the things, right? I'm a cis man, right? Um, I have inherent um, and an enculturated and indoctrinated. indoctrinated um, transphobia and sexism that I that unfortunately I will miss um, and in the moments that I do miss these particular things it's important that I decenter myself uh, and decenter my ego and allow myself uh, uh, to, 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 to listen and to hear uh, and to hear and one of these ways I actually think about when um, uh, in, in, a, in some creative writing classes um, I absolutely love teaching poetry um, it makes me so very happy. And, 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 and I always tell my students, if I was a better writer, I'd be a poet. Um, but in, in, in this way, I, uh, I like to talk about poems as Im image, uh, imagistic systems, right? So uh, don't think about what the poem is trying to do, right? Take it literally and look at the thing, um, which has historically worked for me until I had a class um, with a student who was born without vision. Um, and so then it begged, it asked me, uh, it, it made me realize like, wow, you're actually uh, ableist, right? Um, in this particular way, because now I can't go in and say, what do you see? Because, because it, it asks me, if I say that, then it, it's, it says, then what do you, th then how do I think uh, the, the, the disabled uh, person engages with the art, the, the person without vision engages with the art. And it's not to say that they don't, Right, they just do it in a different way, and so from that, right, I, I had to take a step back and say, what do I actually mean by these things, right? And uh, also, what I love about the book is it talks about uh, the creation of collective craft meaning, because in in um, in having the student in the classroom, I, I said, oh, I don't have actually any um, uh, writers who are uh, disabled. I don't have any writers. Who, uh, 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 with, I don't have any stories with any disabled writers in them. And so I, I went and found a poem and we talked about what does it mean for this sensory information to come through, which was very interesting is that the student without vision um, claimed, uh, or re, I don't necessarily know if they reclaimed, but they claimed the term image, which to me, I said is only the visual. And they said, no, the image is a, is a system of, of, of sensory details. Right. And, and so and, and as I was I, so a couple of students pushed back and or rather I pushed back and I was like, well, what do we mean by this? And they said, no, we want to use the word image because it fits. And as, as we understand now collectively, this is what the word image means. Now we get to move forward in a more uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that allows us to feel more comfortable in us. We are now a part of the canon in this way, which is incredible, right? I was like, you guys are so smart. And every, every time I go to classroom, I'm just like, why am I up here if you all are sitting back there? <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's great. Um, for two, two reasons. One, we learn from our students and we, you know, that, that's so important. That's such an important part of being, you know, a teacher. I mean, you know, we, it's, it's a mutual process of learning. And the other is that deep reflexivity that Felicia um, you know, emphasizes in her book. But I wanted to ask a question really quickly. When Deborah was talking about risk, Felicia brought up this incident in, in your book where um, a, a student had written about a particular incident, I think at a tennis club, you know, where um, her mother was given some sort of um, treatment, I don't know, some sort of um, rude treatment and someone, another student in the class said, no, that could never happen, right? Um, and the writer was a person of color, the student who challenged her was white. And I sort of wanted to open that up. You know, that's risky, right? When you do put something out there and somebody says, no, that couldn't happen, you know? 
Um, how do you handle those sorts of situations? What, how do you know? How do we deal with these tricky um, moments of risk in the classroom? Um, so I'm experiencing that now, uh, having put this book out. You know, I'm experiencing immediate responses on social media, um, where white often male professors will respond so quickly to any news about the book, um, everything from racism doesn't exist um, to a quote that I've actually extrapolated and am using in facilitations because it's so rhetorically fascinating um, in terms of uh, saying, I've never experienced a harmful workshop before. And if such thing exists, I highly doubt, right? That it's, it's um, uh, impacting many students, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so there's, there's immediate denial and defensiveness when it comes to um, decentering ourselves from the experience experience, right? When, when we are so accustomed to text tailoring themselves to a, a white reality or white orientation, when it's not um, uh, living up to that standard, right? We, we could call that craft the norm. Um, then we want to change it um, and manipulate it back to where we're in a safe place, where, where white readers are, are centered again. Um, my own workshops um, do not uh, engage in that sort of free reigning bias. That conversation would never happen um, because uh, the, the workshops are writer centered. Um, we follow uh, a Liz Lerman methodology um, in which students uh, moderate their own feedback. Um, I've incorporated into that methodology an artist statement in which um, writers reflect on their project, they articulate a vision that, that they have for that project, recognizing that it's process, that this isn't the product, this isn't the thing at the end, um, but it's it's a step toward um, that vision. Um, any any uh, successes and challenges in relationship to that work, how they're feeling about it emotionally, right? And we take in that, um, that reflection, that author's letter um, before we engage with the work. And they articulate three craft-based questions um, for us uh, to guide the conversation. And they lead us through those craft-based questions um, so that their workshop feedback is targeted, um, specific, um, respectful, uh, and and free of that sort of bias, right? We engage in questions as opposed to opinions, um, and we we best serve um, to um, honor the the artist's um, intentions. So um, it opens up workshop for works that take risk, for works that speak to a personal experience, for works that are in dual languages, or that incorporate the language of home or friendships, right? Those, those voices that are so often missing from the page because we're trying to manip manipulate everything into a standardized norm of what is good writing, what is good craft, right? When we break that open and allow people to own their own works and the stakes for their own works. And as Matthew said, the terms for their own works and how we're going to discuss it. Um, there's no room for who the professor, the peer to um, put themselves in the middle of the conversation and say, mm -mm, never happened to me because no one's asking you. It's for once in their lives, no one's asking you for your opinion. Instead, we are listening and receiving another's work. That's great, Matthew, you were gonna add something? You know, I, have a I have a question for, uh, for Felicia. Uh, one of the things that, that gets brought up a lot within workshops is um, uh, one, this idea that the writers are never smarter than their work, right? So allow the right. So the, you know, you, when you go out there to when you write, you intend to do a thing, and sometimes I've heard right from uh, you know these canonical 
uh, writers that when the work shifts into something that you didn't intend for it to do, that's when the real work happens in this particular way, right? Which for a long time appealed to me, but ha having read the book, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking more to myself, right? Um, what happens, I'm asking the question, what happens when we, um, we prioritize uh, we, or we move the, the writer's intentions up the priority list. And so I'm wondering how you make sense of um, this particular, uh, uh, I suppose, um, rule, right, that has, that has always kind of just been. I think of what, what's beautiful about this Lerman methodology is that there's an opportunity within this like four or five step process, depending on how you know, each class adopts their own kind of way forward. Um, but essential to the process is this step called neutral questions. And um, we engage in this question answer exchange with the author. And I found this personally, um, and I've, I see it in my students, when we ask, right? Um, like, what were you thinking with the voice? Like, what are you trying here? I'm genuinely curious, right? To know um, what's happening on the page. Um, and the author sits back and says, huh, let me think about that. I haven't thought, I've been working toward this draft, right? And let me teach myself what it is that I'm doing on the page. And when they speak it aloud, they're suddenly listening to themselves. I think our, our intuition is so powerful and yet we're told neglect it, neglect it because the outer is the goal, right? That thing is the goal. Hemingway is the goal, not, not whatever mess you've got going on in here. But when we allow ourselves the opportunity to just articulate what it is that we did or we want for our work, we teach ourselves the next step. We teach ourselves how to make that turn. Um, or if we don't have a good answer to that question, like, whoa, that is amazing. I haven't thought about that. And I'm going to take that question home and it's going to transform my draft, right? If we just engage um, to just support, just out of pure curiosity, I think it's a, it's a really um, meaningful step in the workshop that right now is just completely missing in terms of just silencing and telling the writer what to do. Um, the next class that I'm teaching at Colorado College is called Three Questions, and it's all about learning how to be curious individuals, learning how to listen, and learning how to ask really good questions because writers need this for the rest of our lives, and yet we're not training in how to do it. I do think new models of the workshop are emerging, uh, and um, I, you know, this again, reflexivity is so incredibly important, but also I really love the idea of curiosity and wonder rather than critique, uh, you know, as a, as a workshop participant. Um, so yeah, those are really progressive st strategies. Um, I, I think I'm going to very quickly maybe go to my other question and then turn to the audience Q&A because we already have some questions coming in. Um, and I think I'll start with you, Deborah. Um, Right now, there are amazing writers of color who've had an indelible um, impact on literature writ large, that is on fiction, poetry, essay writing, playwriting, every genre every, you know, that you can think of in literature, you know, from Zora Neale Hurston and Lorraine Hansbury to now with Ta-Nehisi Coates and Sandra Cisneros and Edwidge Danticat, Jhumpa Lahiri, you know, Colson Whitehead, I could go on. But overall, we see so few students um, from communities of color in writing programs. As you're saying, perhaps they're told that their writing is not good because it's being compared to some traditional standard. Um, what can we do to ensure that our MFA and undergraduate writing programs draw a diverse and inclusive student body? What, how can we all make sure that they feel welcome, supported, nurtured in predominantly historically white institutions? That is such an important question. And this book really helped me think uh, deeply uh, about that. And so some of the things I was, um, you know, just sort of thinking about was the ways in which we can engage with younger writers um, at the, you know, the, the university level and the different types of programming that we can do in um, secondary ed and having writing camps or contests or working with undergraduates. Um, I tell this story a lot that uh, one of my um, favorite things that a uh, a group of undergraduates told me is that you know you treat us like we're your colleagues and, and I didn't know if if that was like like good or bad like am I being you know too much or are you saying I'm kind of this is nice to sort of you know um, opening things up and democratizing um, the space and I would hope it was the last 
thing. And so just really working with younger writers and thinking imaginatively about programming, about different opportunities to connect. And so they can see that next step of being part of the writer's workshop about, you know, moving um, from and beyond um, the BA or even just getting to the BA and then, you know, going forward, just developing those relationships early. Um, and then the other part of it is the retention, right? So when they're there, which kind of goes back to the issue of self-reflexivity, um, just being really, um, you know, not denying the epistemological solipsism of the workshop process, of the revision process, of how readers hear and receive your work. Like all of this is real. So how are we all going to work um, and move through it? And just putting that on the table, I think, um, is so key. And then I, I just think that the last thing um, that I will say is uh, in terms of like that retention part. So if you're lucky enough to get that really um, diverse cohort, not just in terms of identity, but also in terms of thought, diversity of thought within historically marginalized groups as well. And I'm not even talking about politics. I'm just saying like really thinking about who you have in the room really intentionally and what those varied voices are going to bring in. So then that means what types of um, support systems are you going to have that might look different from the ways in which programs usually offer support? It may not look like you know, going to the bar and, you know, whatever, talking about, you know, uh, you know, letters and the canon or whatever, it might look like something different that's specific to those communities in which you want to nurture. And you won't always know that until you ask. And you won't know that until you kind of think out of the box in terms of what that mentorship and sponsorship might look like. Thank you. Mickey, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think, um... For me, it's, you know, treating uh, the students that you currently have in your program well, so that by word of mouth, um, it's something that they would encourage other writers of color to do. Um, and I think that institutions should think about the difference between um, being a black person and moving to Iowa City um, and being a white person potentially already from the Midwest and moving to Iowa City. Um, that more than just beginning an MFA program starting grad school um, and all of that kind of tension and anxiety. Um, there's also the anxiety of moving to a place that's less diverse. What does that mean? What is that adjustment? Are you reaching out to students when you know there's only two new incoming um, like African-American students or students of color. Are you reaching out to them to see how their adjustment process is going? Are you connecting them with other students of color, whether they are alumni or currently there? Um, are you creating programs and sponsoring events for um, these students to be together and to connect um, and making sure that uh, not just getting someone there, but making sure that they are okay emotionally and mentally um, and within their writing. Another thing is um, a lot of the, a big draw of going into an MFA program or even just a creative writing program in undergraduate um, are the people you get to work with, right? Um, so not, so making sure that you have that diverse faculty um, or even even if you just have like diversity within who's visiting, who's coming to speak, who's coming to read, um, something that would draw in a crowd that is more diverse um, rather than just dangling um, the end result, the MFA, uh, the degree, um, but really making sure that um, the experience itself is something uh, that the writer and, and the student can benefit from. I, I don't want to cut anyone off, but we do have some audience questions and some and very little time left. So I feel as though we should turn to those. And um, I also want to quickly say that in my list of writers, I should have said Toni Morrison. And I wish I could take credit for having this panel on her birthday, but I'm really glad that we serendipitously did that. So that seems to bode well somehow. It's a good omen. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with some audience questions, um, which is not addressed to anyone in particular, but um, it's from Adrienne Davis Phillips, and it says, how would you approach this concept of decolonization in the writing community, for example, a writer's group, where craft is only being centered in whiteness, there seems to be an overarching theme of superiority of the European authors. So we'll answer that live. Mm -hmm. Would anyone like to tackle that one?
Um, so, uh, yeah, to, to use non-white canon, I, I, um, is one, one is, I think is, is an aspect of it. Right. And so I think about, um, I actually, you know, in, in talking about my courses, um, whenever people ask, I'm like, you know, I have at least 75% of, um, uh, uh, queer and or writers of color. And, and honestly, it's, it's, it's actually a hundred percent. Um, and it's, it's actually, it's a part of internalized, like this internalized racism and homophobia of fear that makes me say, oh, we don't just teach, uh, we teach white people too. Right. Um, but the truth is I'm like, I don't teach white people. And so I, and it's, and it's not by virtue of like any particular political standing though, I would love to take credit for that, but it was, it's that, um, this is who I read. Um, these are the thing, the lessons that I have learned in writing are in large part um, from these particular writers. Uh, and so, uh, and so I suppose to the to engage with the writing community that is already um, pushing forth uh, 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 white writers, you know, uh, do something. Not uh, I suppose just bring in someone else, bring in, in an onslaught of someone else. Every time you know someone tries to bring in a white writer, just bring in another writer. And the truth is. Right. Um, I think, as Felicia was saying, also whether or not uh, these things are, we view them as successful, right? Um, and so we oftentimes get ca caught up in, as Felicia talks about in the in, in her book, the masters, right, which is a word fraught with uh, obvious um, terrible connotations within Western uh, the Western world. Uh, but you know, it doesn't have to be these people who we view as. The, the, the writers that have stood centuries of time, right? Uh, every, every story engages with point of view. Every story engages with plot. Every story engages with dialogue. Even the stories that do not engage with dialogue, that do not use dialogue, engage with dialogue. And so we get to have these craft questions from a diversity, from, from a diversity of thought, from a diversity of aesthetics, as, as Deborah was talking about. It's just a matter of saying, I'm no longer going to do this. Right, and then doing, it's not, I wouldn't even say doing the work. It's just that, okay, we have this, we have this piece here. We wanted to talk about, um, you know, uh, I guess spare language here. Instead of talking about Hemingway, we can go to Gail Jones' Corregidora, right? Like, and so, and then, and then do it, um, which I think is a really wonderful thing. I wanna to get to a couple of other questions that I think are quite pressing. One is uh, from an anonymous attendee. What practices would you recommend for facilitators to address relevant issues without centering solely on traumatic BIPOC experiences? I, I'm sorry, Gigi. I think I, I keep I keep over talking, and I think Felicia wanted to say something after me. You're not over talking. You're you're amazing. Um, no, I just I you like excite me. There's so many things that I I think that there's a and I think I. I think I want to say this now for three questions. So I think it's relevant across the board is that in order to activate change, we need to go from passive to active. Like we need to uh, like accept that these things aren't just happening to us. Oh, there's no writers of color who are submitting to our program or, oh, there's no writers of color within our reading group or, oh, you know, the faculty just don't want to do the trainings and we can't force them to do trains, right? Instead, we, we commit to like actively pledge to take on the work. And that comes from every angle. It comes within the writing community groups. It comes within the nonprofits. It comes within the institutions of higher education. Um, it takes each and every one of us to commit to that work. And, and within my own classroom, I just say, yo, what are you into? What, what students, what are you, who are you reading? Who are you listening to? Who are you watching? Bring that stuff in, right? And let's engage. Now, who do you match with that? Right, like that's a that's an opportunity to experience joy. I mean, the the lecture that I'm giving now across Colorado College and different classrooms is about Black joy and like having conversations about race and sex and, and sexuality and and gender, um, and class through the lens of joy. There's so many ways to do it if we just say that's the way I'm gonna do it. Um, and and so I just encourage us all to commit. And, and take risk and, and engage with a different way. So that answers, I think, the trauma question. Um, and uh, I just wanted, this is an interesting one. What do you believe white cis queer people can do 
to address white supremacy and anti-racism advocacy within the queer community in our spaces. Um, uh, I, I think I said this before, uh, but operate from the lens that you are racist, right? Um, operate from the lens that you are, uh, let me make sure I'm, I'm reading this correctly. Did I see it? I don't, I don't see the question anymore. Um, uh, yes, operate from the, from the lens that you're transphobic and, and racist. And, um, and this is not to say that, and, and I get so, I guess it's so frustrating a little bit when I, when I hear people talk about these terms as if they're these pejorative things and rather they create these structures cause great harm, right? Um, and I don't wanna take away from that. But the truth is, um, as we begin, as we look at these things, as these, as, as, as studies, right? Um, they're objective, right? Um, America is a racist society period, right? There's no, this is, we're not that bad. No, it's just racist, right? Like it's just transphobic. It's just, it's all of these things. And so accept it. And so, and I think about um, the, uh, again, Felicia's book in all these wonderful ways, right? Is to, is to, is to eliminate posturing. She, she brought up um, uh, Baldwin in, in, in this way, right? And he's, he talks about how uh, in an interview, he says, you know, preaching is, is, is to, is to posture and to, and to, you know, uh, uh, cater towards a particular thing, but writing, writing is to question, right? And if we engage with the writing process uh, as, 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 as a community, then one must believe in the, the questioning of things. One must believe in the possibility of one's own fallacy, fallibility, right? And so to, to, to walk into a room and, be, and, you know, and say, I am, I'm white, I, me, Matthew, I'm cis, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm masculine. I exert a particular kind of pressure on any room that I walk in, um, even and, and pressure is exerted upon me. But to say that and to walk into the room is to say in the moments that I am challenged, remember that I don't see something, right? Um, and even if I think I do, accept that I don't. And it allows us, as Felicia says, to listen. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the deep listening part is so key, which is uh, a major component of this book. And one of the things um, that was particularly effective for me is the way it sort of deals with this, um, oh, we'd like a more diverse this or that, or we just don't know where to go. <laughs> well, you can't say that after um, read. well, you can say it, but it just wouldn't be genuine. But um, to the point of that last question as well, just um, being really, intentional, we keep bringing up self-reflexive, like making those connections between what you're writing, what you're reading, what you're teaching, and how you are interacting with people on an everyday basis um, interpersonally, right? I mean, when I was in graduate school, we used to joke a lot, this was a time where everyone's, you know, sort of reading bell hooks, and she was the center of everything, and, and my student of color cohort, we used to always say, if Bell Hooks was in the office next to you, you lose your mind. <laughs> but you're, you know, you like to quote her, you like to invoke her, and, and in this moment we could talk about something else. But you know, just in, emphasizing, emphasizing that, and that it's, you know, just like, uh, you know, hegemony. It's a process. It's an everyday type of thing that's never over. That's never done. We're never finished. We don't all get it. It's hard. It's messy. But we're gonna keep going. And we have one minute left in our time. So I'm afraid. One thing very, very quickly. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think when we articulate that we are um, committing to an anti-racist agenda and we articulate it to as many people as possible out loud and on the page, on the syllabus, if we hand it out, that allows us to hold ourselves more accountable. So if that's something that you're trying to do and aiming for within your own practice, say it out loud to as many people as you encounter so that they can come to you and say, well, I have some feedback for you because you won't see it. And that's as, as Matthew and, and Deborah are pointing out, I think it's really helpful. Let's all have bell hooks on our shoulders, right? As we move forward. <laughs> okay, well, I think, um, I think our time is up. This was supposed to be an hour long conversation and we're hitting for the 4.30 mark right, right now. So um, we could have gone on and on, I think for another hour, but we have some, we have wonderful questions. I'm really sorry that we can't get to them all. Um, but I wanna thank all of you. Um, you were brilliant, you were insightful. Your book is amazing, Felicia, and it's really sparked some um, 
you know, some in, in immediate sort of transformative um, moves and, you know, thinking in the NWP and in the Department of English, and I think everywhere too. So thanks to you all. Let's keep doing this, this work. And, you know, maybe we can even have this conversation again. So have a great evening, everyone. And thank you for everyone who, who tuned in and who, who um, came to this panel. I hope you're all leaving with great ideas for how to um, enrich your classrooms in these ways. Thank you. Please visit the website. Thank you. <laughs>